G'day, uh, welcome to Drawing the Owl 5, an RPG design vlog. Uh, I'm Sydney Icarus, and I am the mm, 2001 Britney Spears of the RPG community. Um, today, we are talking about uh, move structure and uh, kind of a functional and semiotic look at how to build moves. Um, over on the show notes here, which are in the description, if anyone wants to come and have a look with me. Um, episode five run sheet. So what I learned from episode four, we learned about fictional flexibility and how that must be written into moves. And, and we we're talking about like, so this is the episode four run sheet here. We're talking about like this kind of structure, this clouds and dice thing, and um, how writing that into your move, writing, writing a fictional loop into your move gives your players a little bit more work. Um, what I screwed up, we won't be talking about phasic games yet. I said we're going to talk about phases, but we're actually a little bit away from that. We need to stay on move structure just for a little bit longer. Uh, and I also screwed up talking about mashed and aid moves. So uh, what I did, and I should get the designer of mashed name up. OK, I don't have it here. Um, out who designed it first, Mark Clemens. Okay, so um, uh, Mark Clemens, I um, was a little bit uh, incorrect on how I discussed the aid moves in MASH. Um, it's a lot more complex than I realized. Uh, again, I haven't played this. So there is a move that's like, when someone does something, you can give them plus one forward. Like that's, that's core in the system uh, as with most PPTAs. But there's also this like thing about how you've got, when you're doing medical stuff, you've got like a surgeon and you've got an assistant and the assistant can take away consequences from the surgeon's failed roles and all that sort of stuff. I haven't, it's really hard for me to grok. It's very, very difficult conceptually to, to read. Um, but like, so this is the, the medical uh, playbook, I guess, right? And so if we have a look at, um, you've got all these like countdown clocks and, and all this sort of stuff. And like they are up here in the medical moves, it's like treat. So let's have a look at treat over here. Um, you roll on a 10 plus, you can remove one condition from the patient return from duty, all this sort of stuff. Um, but in the meantime, there's this setback and uh, these setbacks, I think, can be removed by this assist move. Um, so you can take one plus one forward on the patient or eliminate any one consequence that resulted. Um, yeah, it was just, I, I don't know enough about it to talk to it now, but uh, it was just a little bit disingenuous of me, um, the way I presented um, Mark's work on Mashed as like, oh, it's just another plus one forward move. Um, what else did I forget? Workload. So Blake Ryan in the Gauntlet community made a really, really good comment to me that um, more fictionality in the moves provides more workload for the players, whereas it's okay and where isn't it? And um, the, I think the best example of this is Blades in the Dark, which is that Blades in the Dark is a very, very um, loose, fictional, guided game about, like, the, the compromise happens at the table, um, and that provides more cognitive load to the table to, um, uh, uh, to like, step up and write the move on the fly. Um, here's an example of that in my show notes here. So um, imagine if go aggro was when you go aggro, decide how intimidating you are, set a target number and a failure number, then roll the appropriate die. Um, if you exceed your target number, you decide how you get what you want. If you don't meet your target number, but don't fall below failure, you decide how you don't get what you want, but maintain momentum uh, or get what you want at a cost. And if you fall below your failure number, um, you don't get it. And a bad thing happens. Um, so this is like the structure of the Go Aggro move, basically. Um, it's, it's actually not because it's not the play that designs, but anyway. Um, but this is like an example of a really, really high cognitive load move um, because you have to decide 
how intimidating you are. So you have to give yourself like a plus one, plus two, whatever, based on the fiction. You have to set a target number and a failure number and based on mechanics. And then you have to roll the appropriate die, but it doesn't tell you what the appropriate die is. So you have to decide that as well. And then you have to decide what happens in all these others. Whereas um, this goes back to something really, really early that we talked about, which is um, Baker saying that um, all Apocalypse World moves are compromises. They're, they're designed to be compromises before they hit the table. And as you saw with that Go Aggro, that's a really good example of what moves would look like if they weren't doing that compromise. Um, and so while I really want to have a large amount of fictional flex at the table, I need to be cognizant that the more I do that, the more I put that load on the table, which is totally okay sometimes because Apocalypse World mechanically asks very little of the table. So um, maybe I can make it ask a little bit more. We'll see. Uh, so this time, this time we are talking about move structures. Uh, how games tell us to build moves for them. So this is like the custom moves section in a lot of these games. Uh, when the fiction gets mechanized or if it gets mechanized, why some moves mechanized and some don't. The sprawl is a cautionary tale of over mechanization. Um, types of move results, the line, and how I build my moves. Now, I'm probably looking at an hour for this, but I, I kind of want to keep all this into a thing. So if I go to an hour and a half, I'll be okay with that. Um, so let's begin. How games tell us to build moves for them. Uh, Urban Shadows, Apocalypse World, Dungeon World. So um, games have since uh, Apocalypse World have said to us, um, there is a way for you to change this at your table. Um, and then given us ways to do it. I'm not sure if like the original like Dungeons and Dragons and stuff did this, um, but like there was always like the rule zero, change whatever rules you want. But I don't think they ever went into as much detail as to like how to meet with the designer's voice while you do it. Um, it's also worth noting that like oh no 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 that's not true. The Dungeon Master's Guide definitely has like um, a uh, section on like how to build your own classes and stuff. So that's that's definitely in there. Um, so uh, Apocalypse World page 285 on the PDF. Uh, and we'll share this over. Um, so this is advanced fuckery. Um, advanced fuckery uh, has a section on moves architecture. Here's a quick look at the structure of all Apocalypse World's moves. All moves take the function when, then, because they're triggered by fiction. So it's when a thing happens, or no, no, sorry, because they're triggered by the table. It's when a thing happens, then you do a thing. Um, act under fire. When you do something under fire, then roll cool. Here are your stakes and your results. Um, They're just all really good examples of that sort of stuff. And here are examples of your triggers and results. So, um, and then it kind of like breaks down. So like, and you can hold, use hold to do things. And like, I don't think there's a particularly, while I think this is accurate, I don't think it's particularly insightful. I don't think that this is what, building an Apocalypse World move is about. I don't, I don't think that you could just say when a thing happens, then you do it, and therefore it's an Apocalypse World move. Um, that's not... There's so much more nuance to it, and there's so much more depth to it. Um, I want to see if Urban Shadows gives a better example, 273. Um, okay, Urban Shadows... So uh, customers have the following outcome, a trigger, an outcome, and stakes. If a move involves a roll. OK, so this is where we start getting a bit of that insight. This is where we start. And um, I'm going to start talking about two concepts throughout this. One is um, formalism, and one is uh, semiotics, or structuralism. Um, basically, the idea is 
uh, and and I'm a film nerd. That's where it comes from for me. So formalism is um, your uh, looking at things as part of their component parts, and semiotics or structuralism is looking at things and what meaning they they present. So um, looking at things as uh, trigger, outcome, whatever is. Uh, um, a formalist approach to it. Like this is a list of triggers. This is a list of of uh, outcomes. And then we just like mix and match. That's that's a formalistic view. Uh, semiotic view is about talking about like what the meanings are. And I think that's where the insight comes in. So um, let's talk about some urban shadows. Um, moves state concrete relationships between a trigger and an outcome. A flow of fiction that pushes characters forward into interesting new situations. That's important, forward into interesting and new situations. It's vital these two elements serve each other, raising the action to a level of a level of uncertainty. Okay, a level of uncertainty is really important as well. Um, there's a line somewhere, and I can't remember where it's from, might even be from Apocalypse World, about all moves are about uncertainty. And I kind of agree with that. Um, so it's important to make the trigger itself evocative and specific. So let's talk about how important this is, evocative and specific. So it needs to be evocative enough that it's interesting, but specific enough that we know it when it happens. This is um, this is your pornography rule. I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. And um, it should look like... Yeah, this is this is some really good examples in Urban Shadows here. When you confess your sins, when you confess your sins is really good because it's up to the player what what is a sin, what is a confession. It's up to the table to decide like what that really means. Um, and then when you confess your sins over when you tell the truth to someone, just like this is what Go Agro is about. That it's not uh, when you intimidate someone; it's when you go aggro, and it just it brings so much more guts to the move. Um, and so that's that's an important thing. Let's come back to this and talk about um, evocative and specific. Oops. Uh, you need to not be caps. It's for upsetting my thing. All right, let's look at the sprawl 239. Um, A custom moves in the sprawl. When you search for pay data in a database for all plot. See, this is the thing about like search for all right, so this does a couple of things I like, but overall is search for pay data really like an evocative? It's certainly specific, but is it like uh, evocative? I'm not really sure. Hit the streets, a nice evocative move that they use. Like that's super cool. Um, what about when you find something hot? That's cool. When you find something hot, roll mind. Like that, that means something to me, right? You know, when you're digging and you find something. Oh, I don't know, I dig that. Um, all right, fill the flow. Fill the flow is really good because um, I would probably, ch this is really specific. This this tells you a really specific idea of what it wants you to be. I'd probably change it a little bit, but I love the idea of like it being flow. The flow remains smooth. Um, yeah, that's kind of cool. The idea of like weaving in and out of traffic and stuff, That's that's cool. So a move like this gives mechanical weight to the setting by including dangerous complications that add specific color and life. Ooh, Hamish, nice. Gang control of the inner city and impersonal road clearing machines. Cool, I like it. And I like it because um, traffic cleaner doesn't actually mean anything. Um, that's up to your table, what that means. So it can be a road clearing machine or it can be like, that's an assassin. Like a traffic cleaner is just what people call assassins or whatever. Um, but they should say something intentional about the setting in a genre. So let's talk about that intentionality because that's really important. So they should say something intentional about the setting genre. Okay. 
And I have not been doing that properly. Um, the move says the drug use has beneficial short term trade offs, longer term negative effects. Mm, yeah, okay, that's cool. That's cool. Um, So this is really talking about where you put your move, and that is um, the move should be at the point of highest drama. Um, buying the drug versus using the drug. Uh, that's a good good comment, Hamish. I like that. Um, and then there's one last thing that we need to talk about that I haven't spoken about on this show before, and that's Simple World. And it's actually been kind of weird how long I've gone without talking about Simple World. Um, God knows where I've even kept it. Um, might have just left it in my downloads folder. Um, so Simple World is Avery Adler's approach to... Uh, Avery Alder, sorry. Avery Alder's approach to um, how to build a PBTA game. Huh. That's weird. I don't have it in there. I might have to find it again, download it again. That's okay. So Simple World is um, uh, basically a a step by step instruction um, of how to do PBTA hacks. Um, Simple World. Um, So it says to start with what you game what you want the game to be about, create stats, um, change the tendencies to create four or five stats, um, do your MC moves, have a help and hinder move, which are those same boring ones based on relationship stats, um, and then create player moves, basic moves. Here we go, basic moves. When you take an action that risks failure, roll with one of your stats. On a 10+, plus, you succeed. As appropriate, the MC might award you resource points, harm dealt, or a bonus to carry forward. On a 7 to 9, hard bargain cost. Helping and hindering. When you help and hinder someone, roll plus stat, yeah. So this is, this is what I was talking about before, about like cognitive load. Um, and this is... Uh, the way that the way that World of Dungeons gets around this, World of Dungeons being the OSRE version of Dungeon World, the way that World of Dungeons gets around this is that all moves are that um, open-ended sort of role, if you, which works just great for that structure. Um, but if you have some which are that and some which are specific. I think you'll get really weird overlaps, like really weird um, cognitive overlaps. Um, overall, I, I I really respect Avery and her work, but I'm not sure that I'm not sure that Simple World is what we want to look at. I think we're going to look at Monster Hearts more for for that work. Like I think that Simple World is not the way that I want to approach writing these games. Um, so let's talk about what's next on our run sheet when the fiction gets mechanized or if. So this is something I found really interesting looking at, at mirrors, which is, um, so if you remember these dice and clouds things, some mechanics loop back into mechanics and some shoot into fiction and some like shoot into fiction and then come back to mechanics. Um, but here's, here's an example of what I'm talking about. So if you remember this move from like episode two or something like that, when you hold off an army with your laser sword, roll the dice. On a hit, you deflect their blaster bolts, you take no harm, and hold the enemy at bay. On a partial, you hold them off, but choose one. You're overwhelmed by fire and take one harm. Your laser sword is damaged in the fight, cross it off your sheet. Um, On a miss, you are overwhelmed and have to get yourself out, take one harm, and cross off a force point. So this as a move does that 
back and forth thing. It does it does kind of this top one um, where it hits the fiction and, and loops back around. So mechanically on a hit, you fictionally deflect their blast, blaster bolts and probably fictionally hold them at bay, but you mechanically take no harm. On a partial, you hold them off and you are overwhelmed by fire. And that means you take one harm. And this is this is kind of the other version of this move where it's where it's just the mechanic feeding back into the fiction, um, where it says you hold them off but choose one. You are overwhelmed by fire. Your laser sword is damaged in the fight. You are overwhelmed and have to get yourself out. So this is like, um, huh? This is this is the interesting bit, right? Where it's like, um, when do you want to do this, and when do you want to do the one above? Um, and I don't think either of them are better, but I, I will say that Blades is, is all the second one, uh, except for tiny, tiny little bits. Um, Blades is all about, like, you rolled a four or five on a um, desperate limited position. What does that mean? Uh, and that, you know, you have less effect is a very f fictional response. It's... Oh, interesting. Interesting. Because it is mechanized, but it's fictionally mechanized. It's very broadly mechanized. It's broadly, broadly mechanized. Um, so let's have a look at the next question here. Because this is this where we'll start getting into some depth things. Why do some moves mechanize and some don't? So why are these moves like what they are? So let's have a look. Uh, Apocalypse World Basic Ref Book. Um, we come down to our basic moves here. I always like starting with Apocalypse World because of the granddaddy thing. And I like starting with Go Aggro just because we're so familiar with it as a as a team now. So Go Aggro on someone. Make it clear what you want them to do. Tell them what to do it. Roll hard on 10 plus F to choose. Force your hand and suck it up. Cave and do what you want. Get it hard. So this is this is an entirely fictionalized move. Um, Go Aggro is into, at no point does it say like you force your hand and suck it up, you deal X harm. At no point does it say, like, cave and do what you want. Um, they change their status with you to ally or something like that. It's totally about... Um, it's totally about the fiction and about what that means. And this kind of goes to... Um, this, like... I think we had this armor discussion in yeah we did in in episode four. So let's let's roll at episode four and have a look at what we got here. So um, in Go Agro we were like, if you've got a pistol and you shoot him in the chest, you'll do one harm. But if you shoot him in the head, you'll kill him. And that's what we're talking about here about like about Apocalypse World being fictionalized. It's um. Mm. Mm, okay, so Apocalypse World is uh, fictional, fictionalized results or outputs, we'll say. Outputs. Um, what's another example? Well, Hack and Slash we already talked about. Hack and Slash we talked about in like episode one or two or something like that, which uh, I don't want to go through all these because it's too much at the moment. We're going to go over time. But Dungeon World... GM sheets. Where's my? Is it on character sheets? It is it's on character sheets. So, um, hack and slash. When you attack an enemy in melee, roll plus strength on a ten plus. You deal your damage and avoid their attack. That that is um, hack and slash on the player side is mechanical. And on the monster side is fictionalized. Um, I don't want to keep saying mechanical and fictionalized because they're not, nor is it bounded or unbounded. I need, I need a better way to express this because at the moment I keep saying mechanized and not mechanized, but that's not true because an enemy attacks you is mechanized. Um, Frustrating, frustrating. Let's go with what we've got for now, and we'll see if we can come up with a better term as we as we go or in my off time. Whoa. 
Okay. Uh, looks like the screenshot went weird for a bit, but that's cool. So um, hack and slash on the player side is mechanical and on the one side is fictionalized because on the player side, it says you get to do a certain amount of damage and you can do plus one D6 damage, but you expose yourself to the enemy's attack, which is really, really cool. Um, that, yeah, the, it's kind of that different side. I, I find that interesting. Um, so volley is is an interesting one where like this is you have to move to get the shot is a fictionalized outcome, but minus one d six damage is a mechanical outcome. Reducing your ammo by one is a mechanical outcome. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting they're mixed in there as well. So they are mixed. Um, position equals. Fictional. Um, ammo damage. Um, okay, I think I want to find one that's just mechanical, which I think would be probably in the sprawl. Chapter eight is matrix moves. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. cool. Cool, 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 So let's ignore ice is activated. This is almost entirely, the seven to nines are almost entirely mechanical. Um, passive trace plus one trace. An alert is triggered, advance submission clock. Your access is restricted. Take minus one on going to matrix moves in this system while your access is restricted. Um, okay, so login almost fully mechanized. Now, the interesting question is, and this is something we're going to have to read the text for, passive trace does nothing until it reaches a certain level, then the corpse come up to your physical location. Triggering alert is also harmless on the mission alert. Right. Okay. Okay. So this, triggering an alert is also harmless when the mission clock is low, but gives the whole team less room for error. The way this is phrased tells me that Hamish doesn't want you to fictionally trigger an alert as well. He only wants you to advance the mission clock. If we're trying to sneak in somewhere undetected and our mission clock is at three, which is the, the first flag, it's it's like a it's like a clock, right? So it's like zero, three, six, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Um if our mission clock's at three, if it's one segment marked and we want to, and we and we pick triggering an alert, I'm not empowered as the MC to say an alarm goes off in the building and now things fictionally are happening that would happen with an alarm. You know, the, the guards are more wary, they're well armed, all those guys that you put to sleep, or all those guys that were asleep wake up. Um, I'm not allowed to do that because an alert is triggered, it's just advance the mission clock. Um, and there's there's really specific things about what a mission clock means as well. Um, so it's a mechanized, that's a really mechanized result. And the same with your access is restricted, which is minus one on going to matrix moves. You can still go anywhere, anywhere you want, um, you just take minus one on going. Um, you can see it's not like it's not like your access is restrict is restricted. You can't use the steal pay data move because you can't find pay data. Um, instead, it's your access is restricted. Just take minus one on going. It's yeah, um, and that's that's really heavily mechanized. Um, and. Uh, so what do I want? So this is, this is where this always gets really, really hard is we talk about what I want in my game. And I think I want to lean towards fictionality, but I need to, that gives me a greater burden in writing because it means that I have to, um, I have to make sure that anyone who reads the book 
can interpret the fiction. And I also have to um, provide a way for the... Uh, I also have to provide bounded fictionality um, because it's still a compromise. What I mean by that is that um, um, I can't let this surprise players and I can't let it surprise GM either. So like, um, imagine if go aggro on a 10 plus or on a seven to nine was like, they choose what happens. And they were like, well, I pull out a gun and they shoot you back. And you're like, whoa, how the, fu how the fuck did I on a seven to nine I rolled and you you shot me like that's not fair like oh, that's not that's not the compromise that we're going into go aggro with um, so that's yeah that that's something that I need to look at so I I wanted to lean towards fictionality but I need those fictions to be a part of the compromise um, which would be interesting very interesting by the way um, blades does this blades makes fiction part of the compromise by using the um, resistance role where and and maybe maybe that's something that I'll do as well. I'll have like some sort of resistance thing where you uh, in blades can take stress to tone down a consequence. Um, I still think that it can be a bit hard because if you're making really hard moves in blades and you're taking away a lot of resources from the players and it is it is a very resource strapped game to begin with. Um, if you're taking away a lot of resources by doing that, your um, and resistance rolls are only like reducing the severity and not like taking them away almost. Like um, the lethal harm one is always a good one, which is like, yeah, he shoots you with, like you walk out of your, of your, let's start the game and make it interesting. You walk out of your safe house, um, a, a crossbow is fired from across the way, it hits you in the head, you die. And the player goes, well, I don't want to die. We've just started playing, so I'm going to resist. And so they roll and they take two stress or whatever to resist, but then they it just goes to level three harm, and level three harm is still like debilitating. Like that's a that's a very 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 hard move to put on your players, um, and it doesn't count as a soft move just because they can resist. So I think like resistance as being able to deny consequences uh, is also a little bit bullshit. But I think it like it needs to be somewhere in between. So it's like. Um, uh, I don't know. Like resisting from level three harm down to level one feels, or level four harm down to level one, or something like that is is really good. Um, because level one's nothing on its own, but if you got two of them, it's it's like minus one d, and then if you've got, oh, it's less effect, uh, and then if you've got three of them, you take a level two harm, and that's really cool. Like the way it builds up like that, I think that that is probably a better way of approaching it. Anyway, we're going to talk about. Um, just some, just some terms, just some terms. So, um, when you hold off an army with your laser sword, this is our trigger, right? This is our, by the way, this is not specific and evocative. Um, uh, when you and your laser sword are an army unto yourselves, um, roll the dice. So, boy, that was a thing. Um, this is our trigger. This is the action, we're going to call it. Uh, on a hit, we're going to call these the desired stakes. Actually, we're going to call this whole thing the desired stakes because the whole thing is stakes. Stake. Um, so the desired stakes is what happens on a par, on a hit. The accepted stakes is what happens on a partial and on a miss, I'm going to call those the groan stakes. Just because of the way that players respond to it with like the mm, groan. Um, so these are just words that I'm going to use. Um, action, desired stakes, accepted stakes, and groan stakes. And I'm going to just use those to like talk about my own moves, basically. Um, oh, sprawl is a cautionary tale of urban mechanization. This is really, really cool. So um, we spoke before about how that login action has almost all mechanized effects. Um, and I think the best way 
to describe the differences between them is to look at how the sprawl handles cyberdecks versus how night witches handles planes um and that's not that's like a little bit um so cyberdex this matrix move um what i'm saying is a cyberdeck is not equivalent to a plane but they treat them in such different but similar ways that we want to talk about it so um, with a cyber deck, when you cut ice, melt ice, sorry, melt ice, cool. So let's talk about ice subroutines. Um, subroutines, harm and damage in the matrix. So when the ice activates the routine damage and intruder cyber deck, the MC will choose a rating on the intruder cyber deck and lower it by the amount specified by the ice routine. The effect of lowering applies immediately. Lowered processor might require deactivating one or more programs. Lowered stealth might allow a trace to succeed. Damaged hardening or firewall will hamper the intruder's ability to protect against future attacks. So this is really interesting because what I'm saying about, um, where is a hacker's hardware? Okay. Uh, okay, it doesn't have it here. It must have it somewhere else. That's fine. We might have to look somewhere else for it. Okay, so black ice. So when black ice executes a routine, choose three. You either advance a relevant mission clock. You trace plus three. You advance a corporate clock. You lower one of the Cyberdex ratings by two. You inflict physical harm, one harm AP, or you prevent them from jacking out and trap their mind. So while I'm, I'll come off that while I'm looking for it. The um, weird part of that is that um, it's this little like mini game of numbers. It's this little like mechanized, almost HP system. It feels so much more trad gamey than it is, um, than it is, uh, PBTA. So let's have a look at a hacker. What are they called? Hacker. So um, the way that that cyber decks work, here we go, defensive deck and performance deck. So the way that cyber decks work um, Christ, uh, is you have hardening two, firewall two, processor one, stealth one. All right, so what these mean? These actually have things that they mean. Um, processor, I think you I think you can only choose to go in with a number of programs equal to your processor. Stealth is the equivalent is the uh, opposite to trace, where um, when trace exceeds your stealth, it goes through. Um, and firewall is like a safety or firewall or still hardening is like a safety valve on it. Um, I'd actually have to to go through this and be like, maybe is it inside where assets? Um, yeah, and so the, when we talk about this routine of like trace one or whatever, trace three, that means something relevant to a deck. On the other hand, um, planes are like, the, in Night Witches planes are just these fictional things. Um, planes. So planes don't have like health or whatever. They just have, they just might become damaged. The nature of damage should be established in the fiction. A damaged plane can land, but it can't be used for another mission until it's patched up. Uh, a plane that in the course of the mission is damaged twice, immediately crash lands or disintegrates. Depending on the situation, this may call for a wheels down move, but the fiery wreck option seems certain. So what's really interesting is that, by the way, I love that shot of the pair two. God damn. Um, the, it's, not, it's not about the plane has health two and the GM can do damage health one or whatever. It's like, the nature because the nature of the damage is fictional if you get hit by 
a wall of flak. And I'm like, so you're Vedemaya, you're a wing woman for another pilot. She goes in and she just gets, she's an NPC. And I'm just like, I'm going to kill her. I'm looking through the crosshairs and I just fuck her up. I just like flap her in the face. And you're like, no, Vedemaya, man, I sweep in and take it. I'm like, great. Your plane just disintegrates. In the sprawl, I don't have authority to do that. In the sprawl as an MC, the only thing that I can do is lower, when I damage your cyber deck, is I lower one of the ratings by two. That's it. That's all I can do. I lower the ratings by two. And as long as you're okay with working with that functionally lower rating, it doesn't mean shit. Um, but in Night Witches, it's fictionalized. And and this is the... I love the sprawl. I love so much about the sprawl. And and I love Hamish as a person. He I bumped into him a couple of times on Twitter. Just I would do anything for Hamish. But I hate that the sprawl demands that I mechanize it. Um, and I hate it because I don't want to. I want to do cool... Like, when we're doing hacking, I don't want to be playing a fucking numbers minigame with my hacker. I want to be doing, like, cool shit about, like, oh, the black ice comes up and is, like, a pew, 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 and shoots you with a laser pistol, and you like, what do you do? And he's like, oh, I throw up my shield program, and it two glances off, and I'm like, oh, cool. Well, um, normally, that would lower your ratings by two, but your shield program says that you reduce lowering by one. Um, like, I don't want to... I don't want to do that. I don't want to come out of the, the cool fiction to like tell him to do things mechanically, which is weird because egrets, which is what I'm apparently calling you now. Oh God. Um, that's what baby owls are called, right? I'm pretty sure baby owls are called egrets. Call a baby owl. Um, wow. This is like the hardest thing outlet what's an egret then oh it's a swan isn't it okay um outlet so my little outlets what i want to do i used to be so in love with mechanization i used to be like everything needs to loop back into the mechanics but it doesn't I, okay i used to think everything needs to loop back into the mechanics but instead, I think the reality is everything needs to matter. So let's let's write this down because I think that's a bit of insight that I haven't had before. So um, uh, let's bold it. Um, everything needs to loop into mechanics is the poor man's everything. Oops needs to matter. And what I'm saying about that is, um, okay, here's another example of a really, really good move that we've spoken about before, which is um, one of my favorite moves in the world, which is Ben Barr's Lift Gates. And if people ever ask me how to design PVT moves, I'm just going to say Ben Barr's Lift Gates. So, um, Ben Barr's Lift Gates, when you try to use pure strength to destroy an obstacle on a 10 plus, it doesn't take a very long time. Nothing of value is damaged. It doesn't cause an amount of noise, and you can fix the thing again without a lot of effort. The important thing to this is that it matters. It doesn't matter that it doesn't take a very long time. Mark one on the dungeon clock. Nothing of value is damaged. M m mark off your weapon degradation table. It doesn't... Breath of the Wild, man. It doesn't make an inordinate amount of noise. Um, it doesn't make an inordinate amount of noise. Uh, or you can fix the thing again without a lot of effort. Now, the idea here, the idea is that, that because you're choosing three, right, on a 10+, plus, one of these can probably not matter, right? So, so one of these can probably not matter, 
because on a full success, you're only choosing three. But on a seven to nine, choose two means that at least one of them, or at least three of them have to matter to make a seven to nine mean anything. And so that's the key. So the key isn't to have clocks and loops and HP and stuff, but to make things matter. Um, a really good example of this is Dungeon World's Dungeon Moves. Um, let's 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 find uh, not Dungeon Moves. Um, monster Moves. Let's find one. Let's find one that's cool. Dungeon World Monster Moves. Dungeon World Color, and we're going to go to Monsters, which I think is on like page a million on this or something like that. Um, uh, monsters 219. Let's go to let's go to 245. Okay, cool. Black pudding. The black pudding classic. Um, Black pudding does D10 damage, which ignores armor, which is a thing, right? That's that's a mechanized thing. But eat away metal, flesh, or wood. If someone, if your fighter strikes with his sword into the black pudding and misses, and you're like, no, nah, yeah, you do your damage. Like, it's, you know, seven to nine or whatever, right? So, yeah, you do damage, but you take his attack. I can either be like, D10 damage, or I can be like, your sword is eaten away, or I can eat away part of your flesh, right? Your arm is eaten away. Now, the important thing, the important thing in the um, in in doing this is that it needs to matter. So if I say to him, "Yeah, no, it, it eats away at your arm," and he's like, "Oh, so how much damage do I take?" I'm like, "Well, you don't take any damage." He's like, "Oh, cool. So can I like can I not swing with that hand anymore?" I'm like, "Well, no, no, you can." Um, he's like, well, then what the fuck happened? I'm like, "Well, you got acid." Well, that doesn't matter. And that's that's the difference is it needs to be fictionally relevant. And, and it doesn't mean it has to be mechanically relevant. It means it needs to be fictionally relevant. So it's like it eats away at your arm and like um, you just like you just start bleeding. Like you're, you're bleeding freely from this arm. Wow. Uh, oh, boy. Okay. Well, I'm going to hack and slash again. You're like, yeah, sure, go. And then like two or three moves later, you're like, Doug, You've played out like black gates. Roll, roll your thing, or or defy danger with constitution just to stay awake right now. Otherwise, you pass out. Um, and that gets it back into the moves, yeah, and it mechanizes it eventually. But it's it's a fictional process, which is cool, and that's what I want. That's what I want. That's that's what I want. I don't want harm clocks, and I don't want. I don't want plus one damage and stuff like that. I want things to matter. I want things to matter fictionally. All right, so let's talk about the success gradient. The success gradient is really interesting. Um, I'm trying to push this along just because of how long all of these episodes go. Because <laughs> I get caught up just being enthusiastic about shit. So um, types of move results. There are a bunch of different types of move results. Um, but basically, a 10 plus will usually be either you get it, which is like you achieve the thing you set out to do. You get it and you get a little bit of mustard. You get something on it. So like a scrounging night, which is, is when you go looking for stuff, roll plus um, skill, I think, maybe guts, maybe even luck. God, I love night witches. Um, you roll it and you find it. And on a 10 plus, you get to add one to the mission pool. So it's like you get what you wanted and you also get more, which is super cool. And then there's also the 10 pluses that are you get it, but, um, and they're usually things like um, uh, Seize by Force, Kick Some Ass in Monster of the Week, both of which are like, even on a 10 plus, you're going to cop some harm back from the enemy. Um, Monster of the Week is one, I don't actually know Kick Some Ass uh, top of my head, so let's talk about it, or let's at least look it up. The basic hunter moves kick some ass. When you get into a fight, kick some ass, roll plus tough. On any success, seven total or more, you inflict harm and suffer harm from whatever you're fighting. On a 10 plus, choose one extra effect. Uh, you gain the advantage, take plus one forward, give one forward, and you inflict terrible. Right, okay, so it's it's kind of seized by forcey, which is great. So, um, especially 
in Monster of the Week, these monsters are going to be big and they're going to be doing a shitload of harm back, right? So, like, um, even a 10 plus has a cost. Um, Bars has this kind of thing. Um, because in Ben Bars, if all four matter, if all four matter, then you have a cost because you can't do one of them. Um, Gaigro is an interesting version of this, which is you get kind of what you want, but it's their choice in the end. Um, so in Gaigro on a 10 plus, they can choose to either do what you want or to take the consequences of whatever you threaten them with, which both are kind of good outcomes. But obviously, as a player, you want the one where they do what you want, but agency is preserved, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, turn someone on is exactly the same in that on a 10 plus, you get some good stuff, but um, you get like a string on them, but uh, they also can choose how to react and those reactions are out of your hands. Um, why? This is the ideal. The 10 plus is what players roll looking for. It needs to be attractive without breaking fiction because they will roll it. So this is a big thing, is that, is that um, a 10 plus that says in Monster of the Week, uh, kick some ass, on a 10 plus, you kill the monster and you don't get killed yourself. We'll break the fiction because, uh, so PBTA's, PBTA's resolution loop is really, really short. It's a, it's a single roll. Um, and there's very few pacing mechanics. Um, we've spoken about a couple of them before about how read a person is pacing, pacing mechanic, uh, about how, uh, harm is a pacing mechanic, all that sort of stuff. But like uh, harm, we, we're usually talking about like three or four segments. Uh, how much harm do you have in in Monster of the Week? Um, harm, you have a fair bit actually. You've got like three, four, five, six. Unstable injury. Ooh, unstable. Oh, Monster of the Week, I need to play you. You are, you have some good shit. Okay, so um, let me just fix my camera focus here. No, still, whatever. Um, so, Monster of the Week. Uh, if it was you kill the monster and it doesn't kill you, you're going to break your fiction because players will roll 10 plus actually a fair bit. In their main stats, in their plus twos and stuff, um, different for different games, but Dungeon World players will roll 10 pluses a fair bit um, because they're going to get plus threes in their main stat really easily. Uh, and then they're going to start looking at 12 pluses, which is insane. Um, so it needs to be attractive without breaking fiction because they will roll it in Forge in this war. What do I want this to look like in Forge in this war? I think I want my. 10 pluses to be primarily um, you get it and with a little bit of you get it but um, 7 to 9 7 to 9 has different types um, there's the there's the straight you get it which are like uh, research reach out that sort of stuff so let's have a look at research in the sprawl um, basic moves research. By the way, I love the term acquire agricultural property for uh, dying in the sprawl. It's like my favorite shit. Uh, why are these not alphabetical? Or at least structural. Paid. I've gone past research, right? Must have. And if I was good at this, I would have them all prepped. Um, when you investigate a person, place, or object, ask a question from the list below and roll mind. On a 10 plus, you get you you get your question answered and you get a follow up. On a 7 to 9, you take Intel and you get your question answered. So like a 7 to 9 is just you get it. You you get what you want. Um, then there's and and like research kind of has a an end kind of thing with Intel, but Intel I feel like that's kind of the core of research, so I'm not really happy with it because um, it's just mechanizing. Intel is just mechanizing the answer that you get um, because it wouldn't be the sprawl if it didn't mechanize it. You get a butt. You get a butt is racked under fire. It's you stumble, hesitate, or flinch. Uh, you're offered a hard bargain, ugly choice, worse outcome. 
uh, use magic in Monster of the Week. Oh man, how am I? How the hell am I falling in love with Monster of the Week? It's not even my genre that I'm into, but god damn, it's well written. When you use magic, say what you're trying to achieve uh, and how to do the spell. Roll plus weird on a ten plus. It works without issues. Now seven to nine is what we're talking about. It works imperfectly. Choose your effect and a glitch. The keeper will decide what effect the glitch has. So this is cool because this this here is giving authority to your GMMC keeper to mechanize the glitch. So effects uh, inflict harm, enchant a weapon. Do one thing that is beyond human limitations, buy, replace, or portal trap a specific person, minion, or monster, banish a spirit, etc. Glitches. The effect is weakened, sh short duration, you take harm, magic draws immediate unwelcome attention as a problematic side effect. Now, I have a problem with uh, this one because it says you take one harm, ignore armor magic, because I think that the ability to decide how much harm comes across is a really important part of MC pacing. Um, if if characters are really really and characters have a lot of harm boxes in um, in Monster of the Week, but if it, that just said you take harm, a character saying no 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 I'm happy to take harm and it's up to the MC to, in being a fan of the player's characters in fitting with the agendas and principles of the game, choose how hard they want that move to be, choose how how rough they want that pacing to be, and. Um, this is the equivalent of that dungeon world thing of like the goo. Um, maybe I don't want you to take one harm in Karama Magic. Maybe I say when you cast it, your stomach feels uncomfortable. Mark your unstable harm box. And they're like, what? What's happening to me? No, just mark your unstable harm box. You, you've been harmed unstably. Um, yeah. And that makes me really happy. So I dig use magic as as an idea um it's very very cool thematics very cool thematics um and you don't get it but so go aggro is a good example of you don't get it but on a seven to nine so on a seven to nine they can choose to do what you want but they're not going to most of the time but they um but you do get something like they get out of your way or they um okay I think Go Aggro is one of my favorite moves on a 10 plus and one of my least favorite moves on a seven to nine. Uh, I should bring it up if I'm gonna talk about it. So uh, what I love about Go Aggro is 10 plus is this agency choice about like, do you wanna take the established consequences or do you do what they tell you to do? Cause that's awesome. On a seven to nine, you choose you can choose one of the above they're probably not going to because unless it's really really low stakes in which case why are we rolling um if you would choose to do what you want on a seven to nine why are we rolling um or one of the following get the hell out of your way barricade themselves securely in give them something they think you want or tell you what you want to hear back off calmly hands we can see this is cool because um it's really interesting fiction, but the thing I don't like about it is that in almost every case I've seen go aggro hit on a seven to nine, the rolling player, the player who took the action is unsatisfied because these, it's, it's very, very rare that all of these happen. That, sorry, that all of these are relevant. So remember back to our thing about, remember back to our thing about um, we need to make things matter it's very, very, very rare that all of these matter. So like the player will be like, oh, I want to uh, put a gun to Drummer's head and say, give me all your food. I want him to do one of these because either he sucks it up and dies and then I get to take his food or he caves and I get his food without having to kill him. But these ones get the idea away barricade themselves securely and give them something they think you want. Like, they're not successes. They're really, really good misconditions, on my on my uh, opinion. Dremer picking up all his food, going inside, and barricading himself, I think is, like, a really good miscondition. And just a shitty 7 to 9. Um... What other types are there? Yeah, so I really don't like you don't get it, but 
Um, I also don't like act ups. You don't get a butt. So yeah, I'm going to talk shit about night witches. What are you going to do about it, Jason? Um, moves, day moves, act up. So my issue with act up on a seven to nine is um, is this. So like when you try to get your way by acting like a hooligan. So the the move is the move is when you want when you want something and you try to get it from them from from someone else um you choose two seven to nine choose one you can make someone do what you want ensure there are no consequences to acting up add one to the mission pool the issue is on a seven to nine remember a seven to nine is fundamentally a success with cost if making someone do what you want is something that you need to do on a seven to nine this shouldn't be a choice because a player has to pick it to make it seven to nine, and therefore it's a it's a non choice. It's there only to make you feel like you have an illusion of choice. Because the option of being like, okay, I go up to the captain, and I say, uh, Captain, uh, I'm a lieutenant, but I'm going to tell you that I want this done this way. And you go, oh wow, that sounds like you acting like a natural born Soviet airwoman. Roll act up plus medals. On a seven to nine, do you want to make someone do what you want? Do you want them to do that? Or do you want to ensure there are no consequences for it? Or do you want to do neither of those and just add one to the mission pool? Like it doesn't fictionally follow for me. Um, and I think it's because ACT UP is trying to pull this double duty. ACT UP is trying to pull this double duty of um, times where you ACT UP and there is a person that you need to do a thing or times where you ACT UP and there is not a person that you need to do a thing. So like uh, when you act up by sneaking into the um, into the into the men's camp, the five uh, A uh, whatever their their squadron name is, sneaking into the men's camp and stealing their vodka, that's acting up, right? But um, you're not going to choose make someone do what you want because you're there's no other NPCs involved. You're stealing it. So choose one. Do you want to add one to the mission pool or do you want to ensure there are no consequences? That's the interesting question. Having that, when, you, when there is someone there, you always want to make someone do what you want. When there is not someone there, you never want to make someone do what you want. So yeah, that's, that's a thing. That's a thing that matters to me. Um, that's why I don't like act up in the way that it's done. Um, choice moves. Choice moves tend to fall somewhere between all of them. So you get it, you get it, but, or you don't get it, but are what choice moves are. So in Reader Sitch in Apocalypse World 2nd Edition, Reader Sitch. I have a question in mind, in my head. So much like research, where research is... Um, so research in the sprawl is ask a question. On a 10 plus, the MC will answer it and you get to ask one of these follow-up questions. Uh, seven to nine, the MC will answer your question, which is cool. It's a cool move. Seven to nine, you get it, it's just fine. Uh, I have some thoughts about it, but I don't want to talk about them now. Um, so read a sitch. When you read a charge situation, roll plus sharp. On a hit, you can ask the MC questions. Whenever you act on one of the answers, take plus one. On a 10 plus three, seven to nine, one. Okay. So a seven to nine, if my question is, um, okay, I've come up and Rolf Ball is standing in front of me and I'm not sure what his deal is, but it feels charged. I roll, I hit on a seven to nine. What should I be on the lookout for is a great question to ask. And it's probably the question I wanted to ask. That is my, you get it. Asking any of the other ones is you don't get it, but so like who's in control here? Maybe I find that more interesting. So I ask that and I don't get the answer to my original question, which was, does Rolf Ball want to kill me? But I do get a cool, interesting thing, and that's that's hold one moves and and moves which um which beg a player to which demand a player makes a choice from a list. 
are often a mix of those seven to nine results. Um, seven to nine is where most results fall. Okay, this is a big thing, the snowball. So we'll probably talk about the snowball on its own thing later, but um, success with cost is fundamentally a success. A seven to nine has to feel good to the players and good to the MC, not good to neither. A move where a move where um, when you uh, when you hold off the enemy with your laser sword on a seven to nine, um, you don't hold them off, but they're too weak to do anything once they get through you is dumb because as the MC, I lose all my leverage and the player who doesn't hold them off feels like they failed. Um, and that's, that's a bad, that's a bad move. That is a badly written move for a lot of reasons. So seven to nine needs to be a success with cost with snowball, which means it needs to say, when you set out to do a thing, you do it, but it's not what you thought it was going to be. It's not all it's cracked up to be. It's, Bucking you somehow. Um, this is where players and MCs push against each other. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. It's about push. It's about giving them push. So uh, da, 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 let's come over here. Um, so what I said there at the end is this is where players and MCs push against each other, which is leverage. Seven to nine results need to maintain or generate leverage. Um not reduce. So a seven to nine result that says um, so Fortune This War is a game about scavenging, right? So let's say let's say the move is um, when you uh, run through the sniper lines. Right? So when you run through the sniper lane, so there's, there's sniper alleys and you're going to run through there. And on a seven to nine, we want to give the players leverage, right? So the players... We want to give the players leverage, which is they've, they've run through the sniper lanes. So like you make it to the other side. You make it to the other side. Um, but... And then it's going to be like um, the choose one or she MC chooses one or whatever. Uh, and those choices are going to be things like you, you, you drop something important and it's gone. Back there. Um, or like you take a hit. Um, or like you get wounded, basically. And... Um, or... Um, the snipers catch a good view of your face. Uh, all the shots, the shots alert. The shots alert everyone in the vicinity. So what this is saying, um, what this is saying is that as a player, you get to the other side. So you, you get your leverage. Um, you're running through the sniper lines to get somewhere. It's not It's not a goal in and of itself. Um, so you're running there to get to like Marco's hospital, right? Actually, let's let's do that. Let's do that. Let's let's say um, when you um, make for the hospital, uh, hospital through the sniper lines. So you you make it to the hospital in time. Um, and you carry wounded to the hospital through the snipers. So this is really specific now, but it's because I'm trying to generate a really specific um, example for us. When you carry wounded to the hospital through the sniper lines on a 7 to 9, you make it to hospital uh, in time before they bleed out, basically. So, so you get there with your charge and everything's fine, but choose one. You drop something important back there. Um, now, this is really important. We're going to use square brackets because the pocket sword tends to use um, parentheses to um, describe mechanization, and that's not what I'm doing here. Um, this can't be the wounded. Can't be, because it's fundamentally a success. So it'd be you, you make it to the hospital 
with your charge in time before they bleed out, but choose one. You take a hit, you're wounded yourself. Um, which is like, it has to be you. It has to be you, not the charge. Shot alerts everyone in the area, which like is a problem for future me. This seven to nine is fundamentally it's fundamentally saying that the stakes of this of this engagement are whether you get to the other side with someone before they bleed out. On a 10 plus, yes. On a six minus, probably no. On a seven to nine, yes, you'll do it. You'll do exactly what you wanted, but monkey paw. And that's, oh my God. So seven, seven to nines are the monkey paw. Seven to nines are the monkey paws of Apocalypse World. It's, um, you you get you get exactly what you want. What did you want? You wanted to put a gun to him and tell him to do it. You get that. Mm. But what you wanted wasn't what you needed. And that's monkey paw. Monkey paw seven to nine. That is how I'm gonna have to think about this. Um monkey paw seven to nine. So the monkey paw seven to nine is the you get it but. You get it, but you didn't think this through. You didn't ask the right question. You're not doing the right thing. You are short-sighted. Uh, and that's cool because it's complicity, because it's the player's fault. It's not the player's fault. It's the character's fault. It's the... Ah, so good. Because that's the thing is... Um, so that's why the the 10 plus result of suck it up and take it on... on uh, um. What's it called? The bang bang button. Go aggro. The ten plus result on go aggro of um they that they suck it up and take it is a monkey paw result. That should be in the seven to nine. That should be that should define the seven to nine. It's great to have that in the ten plus because it's agency and it's all that sort of stuff. But the seven to nine, I think, should be designed should be defined by shit like um you you put a gun to the head and you say you fucking do it and then they don't. And then you kill them and you're like, oh, that's not what I actually wanted to do. Um, and that's Monkey Ball 7 to 9. Let's talk about 6 minuses. 6 minuses is really interesting. Um, so uh, there's you don't get it and. There's um, you get it, but it's worse than you thought it was. There's you don't get it, but you do get something. And then there's you don't get it. Um Let's go through them bottom to top because the bottom to top is really, really, really important. You don't get it is really, really rare and should be rare in Apocalypse World because the snowball is always the overriding factor. The idea that, um, remember we were talking about leverage and not getting something, things not happening is really, really bad for leverage. Um, behind enemy lines in Night which is, is, a, is, a, is an example of this uh, kind of working differently and working in a really interesting way. So um, behind enemy lines. Wait, is behind enemy lines not a, not a night move? Behind enemy lines. Okay. On a miss, you don't evade capture. Now, the reason that behind enemy lines can do that is because the stakes of this move are so external. Um, you don't evade capture says something about about what happens to your trip in enemy lines. And that, and that gives the MC somewhere to push, right? And um, so that's okay. But stuff like uh, death saves in dungeon world and stuff like that, are much less so, because in Dungeon World, your Black Gates move finishes with Black Gates. Where's my Black Gates? Where's my Black Gates? Oh, breath. Here it is. Um, on a miss, your fate is sealed. You're marked by death zone and you'll cross the threshold soon. The GM will tell you when. Um, this kind of prolonging uh, pulls off the off the accelerator a little bit with this. But on a six minus, 
you lose all leverage. Both both players. You're dying. And therefore that's just what's happening. Um, face to a name in Urban Shadows does this in a way that really frustrates me because Urban Shadows does the rest of it so well. Uh, it's a faction move, I think, face with a name. Yeah, put a face for name. On a miss, you don't know them or you own them or you owe them the MC will tell you wish. This is actually a really good example because half of it is great and half of it is bullshit. This is bullshit. On a miss, you don't know them. Fuck that. On a miss, no. No, 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 no. When you're putting a face to a name, you are, and it's and it's not when you meet someone, and it's not when you recognize someone. It's when you put a face to a name, which is cool and evocative and specific, and Magpie games are really good at this, I guess. Um, when you put a face to a name or vice versa, on a miss, you owe them. That's fucking cool. And Urban Shadows has debts, and Urban Shadows has uh, an economy, and Urban Shadows has, like, people doing favours for people. So owing someone means something. Not knowing them doesn't mean anything because Urban Shadows doesn't have, isn't about not knowing people. Urban Shadows is about knowing people and about what it means to know people. So um, that's why I hate you don't get it six minuses. Um, you, we're going to skip the next one and go up to the third last one. You get it, but worse. You get it, but worse is really interesting because um, in Apocalypse World, when you read a person, uh, read a person on a miss, you ask one anyway, but be prepared for the worst, which is really, really, really cool because what it's saying is you're going to get fucked. Tell us how, how you, how you want to get fucked. Um, what's your character really? What does the character intend to do? So you're sitting in a, in a chat, the character's like just negotiating with you. It's charged, but it's not violent. And you're like, what does your character intend to do? Now, in my head, I know that that character, like whether, whether that character in my head wanted to move it to violence or not, I know that the player doesn't want a violent outcome, right? They're asking, what do you intend to do? Because they're trying to avoid violence. So what I say is, as my move, what does your character intend to do? His intentions are clear when he removes the sawn off shotgun from underneath the table, places it on top and pulls the trigger in your chest. What do you do? Uh, that is a really, really cool miscondition um, because it gives me leverage as an MC. It says, tell me what you want because I'm going to push on that button. Uh, so you get it, but worse is a really, really cool one. And then you don't get it and. You don't get it and are really good as well. Um, masks is a really good version of it. Uh, I'm mostly bringing masks up because I haven't talked about it today. Masks. Basic moves. Reject someone's influence. Hmm. Influence. Reject someone's influence. Um, so reject someone's influence. Roll. On a hit, you successfully hold to yourself and tune them out. On a 10+, plus, you choose 2, 7, 9, choose 1. Fuck all this. On a miss, the words hit you hard. Mark a condition, and the GM will adjust your labels. So not only do you not get what you want, you then mark a condition, which, like, go fuck yourself, and then the GM will adjust your labels as well, which is, like, Ah, like, that's such a good miss. That swings so hard, right? That that shoots for the fences so hard. Um, and I love it. And I love it because it does what I want it to do. You don't get it and it, it provides leverage. Um, so let's talk about, let's talk about. So it's mostly about preserving leverage. Leverage for the snowball. Um, and so in Forging This War, I refuse to have... Refuse, I refuse to have... Uh, you don't get it. Um, I want primarily to have... You get it. Uh, you don't get an end. 
you don't get it. And um, I'm not going to talk about 12 plus. Okay, so this thing is is important to me, which is the 6 minus uh, 7 to 9, 10, 11, 12 plus scale. I think that was the only reason I was going to talk about 12 pluses here, but I obviously lost steam for that pretty quickly. So um, think of it like um, <laughs> imagine a game. Imagine a, an Apocalypse World game or a Powered by the Apocalypse game where a 6 minus was equivalent to a 7 to 9 result. So when you when you missed, you um, got mostly what you want, but it cost you something. And then their 7 to 9s were, um, I think it was a really cold, and that's like making typing super hard. Um, and their uh, 7 to 9 result was the equivalent to a 10 to 11. So when you rolled a 7 to 9, you pretty much got what you wanted. You pretty much like uh, got the got the jam. And then their 10 plus result was equivalent to a 12 plus, which 12 pluses are usually um, you get what you want, but like it's it's even better. You get to put some mustard on it. What's a what's a version of um, uh, advance the basic moves? Advanced? Advanced moves. Uh, when you do something under fire on a 12 plus, you transcend the danger, the pressure, the possibility of harm. You do what you set out to do. The MC will offer you a better outcome, true beauty, or a moment of grace. Uh, on a 12 plus, when you go aggro, they have to cave and do what you want. You've overwhelmed them. They can't possibly bring themselves to force your hand. So um, imagine, imagine that. Imagine a game where everything was like scaled was like scaled one to the right. So, so when you miss, you actually get most of what you want. It just costs you a bit. And then things just get better and better from there. That's like a really like lighthearted, alleviated game, right? That's like um, uh, the snowball's still there because your seven to nines are still pushing. As long as your 10 pluses are mostly those 10 pluses that are like um, uh, you get most of it. So I think we said like you get it, but... Um, moves like the kick some ass one in monster of the week um like the choices from reader person like ben bars if all four matter that sort of thing um that if you played that game it would still be super functional um it, but it would be it would be kinder and it would be easier and if you went the other way and you played a game where the your seven to nines were like misses so on a seven to nine you don't get what you want and bad shit happens to you. On a 10 plus, you get most of what you want, but it still costs you something. And you kind of need to get a 12 plus to get that 10 plus thing. That's a fucking hard game. That is a that is a brutal game. And so I need to think because that kind of brutality might be what I'm after. Like if I'm talking about a group of civilians who are more like maybe, maybe that's what I want. Maybe I, maybe I want my seven to nines to be like misses. And maybe I want my my 10 pluses to be my seven to nines. Uh, and maybe I want my 12 pluses to be the transcendent ones. Um, or maybe not. It's something I need to think about. So we'll have to have a look at that. Uh, boy. Okay, just due to time, I might make the line the last thing I go into. Um, so the line... Um, is a John Harper blog post um, that I really like. And I'll bring up here and I'll throw a link in the description. I don't have one at the moment, but I will throw a link in the description. Um, and it goes like this. Uh, in the line, players are in charge of the characters. The MC is in charge of the world. Um, sometimes moves ask players to take a little bit of world building. And sometimes um, it asks them to go too far. So the example here is, Nero, what do the slave traders use for barter? Oh, man, those fuckers, they use human ears. This is a case of a player authoring part of the world outside their character. However, they do it from within their character's experience and frame of reference. The question they're actually asking is, Nero, what do you know? What do you as a character know the slave traders to use for barter? Um, rather than um, the, the player 
Kyle, what do you think would be cool if the slave trade is used at the bar? Um, this is an example of, of where it sort of falls apart. So you get the box out, you open it up. What do you see when you open it? And the player's like, oh, I don't know, man, like seven fingers. And, and in the because in the first case, the MC addresses the character and is asking about knowledge that they have. In the second case, they're turning over authorship. Um, and this is important in move writing because there are versions of that move. There are versions of this in Apocalypse World that, that violate it. Um, and there are moves that don't, which is great. So um, here's, I love the Ratman example. When you try to deal with the Ratman, roll plus hot. On a 10 plus, they'll listen to what you have to say. On a 7 to 9, they'll listen but choose one. They're drug crazed. They're arming up for the war. They're staff of blood. Cool. Really cool move. The problem is it's asking the player to author the game world in the moment. And it's because of this. It's, it's because of this, like, there. It's because it's saying you choose... And then starts with this pronoun shift to to a third person. Um, here's a simple fix. There's a lots of ways to do it. Um, the MC chooses it, so it's asking the person who has responsibility for the pronoun at the start to do the choosing. Um, your equivalent, by the way, to this is we'll always go back to this is go aggro on a on a ten plus. They have to choose. Uh, it's not it's not your choice what they do. Um, what else we got here? Uh, here it is. Or if you choose, we change the pronoun to you. You consume their vile drug. You give them a spintel. You let them taste your blood. Don't. You didn't need this. You didn't need this, John. You're better than that. Um, yeah, so like, bam, 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 bam. Similar choices, but all written as actions the characters take. Crossing the line is something that's important to me, and I think it's about, um, yeah, on the fiction, try to lead with you, character focus, but it's actually more um, the player that does the choosing owns the pronoun of the choice. Um. So run away, run away is frustrating. Um, where's where's Monster Hearts? Have I not opened? I haven't opened Monster Hearts yet today. There you go. What a day! How can we talk about PPTA without talking about Monster Hearts more often? Uh, reference sheets, course skins. Okay, run away. When you run away, roll with Volatile. On a 10+, plus, you get away to a safe place. 7 to 9, you get away but choose 1. You run into something worse. You cause a big scene. You leave something behind. These are all player-facing choices. That's really cool. That's awesome. That's exactly what we want. Um, turn someone on is they can either give you a string or they choose. They give themselves to you. They promise something they think you want or they get embarrassed and awkward. That's really cool too. It's not saying that one way or the other is better or worse. What I'm saying is that um, they have to be consistent. Uh, Eye on the door, which is a, an apocalypse world driver move, top of my head. Uh, chopper driver. Oh man, I want to talk about chopper moves at some point too. Um, okay, eye on the door. Name your escape route, roll plus call, 10 plus you're gone. Seven to nine, you can go or stay, but it costs you. Leave something behind, take something with you. Hmm, I'm not sure what my point was when I was bringing that out. Hmm, I'm not sure. Okay, um, but there are moves that, and like, I, I uh, again, I, I adore the sprawl, but it happens in, in the sprawl. Um, you're in, but choose one. Passive trace, ice is activated and load is triggered. Your axe is restricted. This is not. This is not the the character choosing this. There's no there's no fiction associated with this. It's it it's the player choosing at a meta level, um, and that is yeah. That's this is one of those things that cross the line in a way that I don't want to. Um, so the line is something that's important to me. 
So let's talk about the formalism structure. I'm not going to get to, I really wanted to get to like actually building some moves with you to show you how bad I am at this at the moment. Um, but let's just talk about it straight up formalism and structuralism. So um, formalism is the component part. So we're going to talk about, this is from what we've spoken about above what I think I need in my moves. So is the trigger fictional um, is important to me. Um, some can be mechanical, but not many. So the reason this is, instead of saying um, the difference between is the trigger functional is um, when you're at to harm versus when you get wounded. Um, is a trigger evocative, evocative and uncertain uh, and speak to uncertainty? Should that should be uncertainty. Um, we've spoken enough about that. Is the trigger something I want players to do? Uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely, it is something I want the players to do. So um, triggers in Apocalypse World are a definition um, Um, triggers define what players can and can't do. Uh, we'll talk more about that next next time I do this because I'm not going to get to it this time. Uh, is the desired stake attractive? Um, 10 plus is why players roll, basically. Um, does the desired stake introduce no opportunities? Preserve leverage. This is player leverage, though. Um, actually, that should be generate. Generate player leverage. So when the player does something on a 10 plus, it should give them the opportunity to do new things. Um, and that's that player leverage idea. Is the desired stake fictional? Because I want to mostly be fiction. Does the desired stake cross the line? We've spoken about that. Does it offer non choices? This is the. Uh, so um, in Alas, um, for the awful C, which I love. That's for the awful C. Character sheets up. Okay. In alas for the awful C, there's a character called the Boson. Um, the Boson has a move uh, which is reminiscent of the Chopper move um, about asserting pack alpha, about asserting yourself over your crew. When you try to impose your will on your crew, on a ten plus all three and a seven to nine, choose one. They do what you want. They don't fight back. They don't make mistakes. This is what I was talking about with the um, Night Witches thing about how I think. I think they do what you want is a non-choice. I think you guys probably can't see that. It's probably too small. Um, yeah, I think they do what, they, that what you want is a non-choice. I, I think it shouldn't be there in the 7 to 9. I think that on a 10 plus, they do it. And both of these uh, on a 7 to 9, choose one. They 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 do it, but choose choose one. They don't fly back or they don't make mistakes. Um, I don't really dig having functionality of the move as a choice. Um, same thing, chopper moves, which should just be two pages up. Pack alpha, they do what you want. Otherwise, they're a fuse. They don't fight back. Otherwise, they do. You don't have to make an example of them. Otherwise, you must. I mean, like this bottom one and this top one are pretty much the same thing to me. Um, where like if I roll hard and I get a 7 to 9 and they don't do what I want, I'm probably going to have to make an example of them to get what I want because I want it because that's why I rolled. I rolled because I want it. Um, does it say it? Yeah, cool. So, uh, chop and move. Thanks. Um, are the accepted stakes acceptable? That's true. Like, um, Seven to nine is what players will have to accept. Um, is the accepted stake impactful? I.e., does it generate or preserve preserve leverage for GM and player? Is the accepted stake fictional? Does it imply loss or cost? That's probably. This is probably, does it generate leverage for the player? And this is, does it generate leverage for the GM? Does it offer non-choices? We spoke about that. Does it cross the line? We spoke about that. This is for the move as a whole. Is the move, oh, and this is because um, my six minuses at the moment, I'm just going to leave blank until I write uh, GM moves. 
um, which is a later date. Is the move uncertain? Does the move drive fiction? Am I interested in the move? Does the move have multiple lists? Can I explain the move and options? Okay, so this is, um, is the move uncertain is um, about does it like happen at a point of high drama? Is the question. Does the move drive fiction, i.e. does it generate leverage uh, for someone at every result? Am I interested in the move? Um, does it do what I want players to do, I guess? Uh, does it evoke? Um, does the move have multiple lists? This is a complexity problem, um, as is this one at the bottom. I explain the move and the options in three and a half seconds, uh, which is basically, I does it interrupt the conversation? I know, I know there's two R's. And semiotics. So semiotics are the feelings. Um, writing in a move defines what people can do. Sometimes it's directive. So bend bars, lift gates says, when you try and destroy something with strength, which you could do anyway, but when you do it with this move, you have these limitations. Sometimes it's permissive, like escape a situation in Urban Shadows. Because that move exists, I can always escape a situation. There is never a time where I say to the MC, I want to escape, and they say, you can't, unless it's like really fictionally established. Because the move exists, I can do it. Sometimes it's restrictive. Restrictive moves are things like Monster Hearts, because they don't exist. So. The fact that in Monster... Oh, I've spoken about this so much, man. The fact that Monster Hearts has moves about turning people on but doesn't have moves about when you tell someone an uncomfortable truth means that you can't do that. means that you can't look to the mechanics and say, I wanted to tell an uncomfortable truth and use that to bring us closer together. No, you don't get to. You can only turn them on. When you do it, are you trying to uh, sex them up with your uncomfortable truth? Uh, and sometimes it's all of them, like login for the sprawl. So one of the things we didn't talk about with login uh, for the sprawl is that um, in order to do it, in order to actually do uh, a login move, you need gear. You need like authority from the system to do it. So that move is kind of... Um, it's directive because it tells you what logging in looks like. It's permissive because it says that you can log into the systems. It's restrictive because if you don't have the equipment, you can't do the move. And therefore, you can't log in. If you don't have the equipment, you can't log into a system. Um, so from here, it's these, these next pages are like, well, this is all stuff you've already seen, but these next like two pages are actually examples of moves that I've written and I kind of don't, or not examples of moves that I've written, but like, what do I want people to do? And I'm approaching it semiotically uh, first, and then I'll go back and look at it formalistically. So this is like, I want people to listen to the radio. I want people to ask for news of others. I want them to read magazines, papers, to interrogate the fiction. Um, I want them to trade. I want them to manage wounds. I want them to scrounge for scrap, which is a resource economy thing as well. I want them to fuck cuddle and spoon. I want them to reflect on loss, share backstory. I want them to share what little they have. And I want that to be like, I want a really low, low, low barrier to intimacy. I want like, um, Lauren told me that Starcross does this and I, and I need to look at Starcross to do this, but I want, I want intimacy to be casual. Like you kind of jump into it accidentally. Um, dodge fire, I want you to do things when you shouldn't be doing them, like literally dodge fire and maybe metaphorically that's kind of an act under fire thing, which I said I didn't want, but we'll see what happens. Uh, I want you to starve, struggle, and go without. I want you to conduct rituals of the old world. Like, I want you to play Monopoly. I want you to do funerals. I want you to hold weddings. Um, I want you to try to sleep alone. And this is a restrictive move. Because the move says try to sleep alone, it implies that that is a hard thing to do. Um, I... See, this is the thing, uh, threaten. I don't I don't think I want people to threaten. Maybe withhold, maybe like declare and like a lot of the flies way. But I don't think I want like physical violence threatening to be a thing, a part of my thing. Uh, make a promise, maybe lose people to death and abandonment. I definitely want, want that to happen. And I want to make some moves about that. Skrilling way, escaping the war, like that exit point that we spoke about really, really early in this is, is I want like that victory condition. Um, and so that's... 
a list of semiotics of things that I want people to do, and now I need to go through and write moves and then check those against against this like formalistic setup. Um, it's not because of because of what this this is because this is a discussion about me and my experiences in designing this. I've spent like two hours trying to bash moves out, and I have like two lines. It's really hard. It's it's very difficult to make good moves. And I think what I need to do to begin with is make shitty moves and then fix them. Uh, I think I'm better at fixing than I am at creating. So I think I just need to punch stuff out and then go for it. Um, maybe I'll do an episode like 5.5 .5 where I just, or 5.1 or whatever, where I just write moves for like an hour and just show you guys how bad I am at it and, and how much I'm struggling in what my process is um, and kind of share that with you. Uh, but also to show you that, that I can get through it and I can generate something. Um, next time. I think that'll be the next time. I think next time we'll do it. We'll actually go through and we'll, we'll write some moves and we'll talk about them and we'll like, we'll figure out what we're going to do about this game. And then after that, we need to talk about core loop about what I actually want my mechanic to be. Do I want to have stats? Do I want to use um, like demonic influence, black bile, or do I want to like do something else? And there's, there's a bunch of different choices there. Um, and those choices will define a lot about what the game is about. So um, yeah, that'll be the next two episodes, I think. Um, core mechanic and me actually writing moves. Uh, it's been a joy. We have gone to about an hour and a half, a little bit longer than I, I wanted to, but I feel like I got a lot out of this and I feel like I wrapped up a lot of thoughts in this. Um, generating leverage is, is a big thing. So every move needs to at some point generate leverage and generating leverage means more than just you get it. It means that something cool can come of that. Um, and seven to nines as a monkey paw, I think makes a lot of sense to me. Um, that's all I've got for today. Uh, it's been a pleasure to hang out with you, my little Alets. Um, I will speak to you uh, in the future, but uh, until then, keep on drawing your owl and uh, keep your eraser handy. Farewell.